This interview is with Fritz Forer, born November 14, 1931 in Belgium, served in the Royal Netherlands Air Force from 51 through 56 as a jet fighter, pilot, and captain. This interview is taking place in Fairhope, Alabama on July 26, 2011. I am Lori Dubose, manager of the local radio station. <coughs> This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project in the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. Fritz, very nice to meet you. Same here. Pleasure to be here. You were born in Belgium, but then moved to the Netherlands in the Depression era. What was that like? What was life like then? It was the biggest mistakes my folks ever made. Uh, my mom and dad were both born and raised in Holland. But my father was moved to Belgium for the company he worked for and started up his own business. And in 37, when my grandmother died, they got talked into taking over the business, the hotel, cafe, restaurant, along the German border. And that was at the worst of the Depression. We darn near starved to death. As a matter of fact, the place got foreclosed on uh, later on. And from there on in, we were renters of the property rather than owners. And uh, the main thing I remember about the Depression is how little we had and how little business there was. And in the beginning, 37, 38, a lot of Jews streamed across the border with baby carriages, wagons, some cars. Uh, but Hitler stopped the influx in 39, so no more business came across the border. And a lot of the Jews stopped in our restaurant. It was the first, practically, the first restaurant inside the border. And they'd come in to eat, so we had a certain amount of business. But when Hitler closed the border to the Jews in, in 39, that was it. Um, the main thing I remember as a kid, it was very poor. And when I wanted one lousy penny to buy some marbles, my dad said, I couldn't have a penny unless all the kids got a penny, so we didn't get a penny. Uh, that's how poor it was. Then when we were invaded by the Germans, uh, things changed drastically. But that's your next question, right? Yes, tell us about that. Um, on May 10, 1940, all of a sudden the Germans overran Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. And we were so close to the border that we were already occupied before we woke up. When we woke up a little bit after four, the Germans had already passed us by uh, their uh, uh tank train had already rolled by us. They didn't get stopped till they got to the rivers 30, 40 miles further down the road. But we were occupied immediately without a shot being fired. And uh, that's where my story begins five years under the swastika begins on that very day, that very morning at four o'clock in the morning, when we all of a sudden had Germans in the house. Uh, we went to school, believe it or not, because my dad said it's a school day, you go to school. There was nobody there, obviously. Uh, only one other kid showed up and the headmaster. And instead of going home, we hung out in the marketplace and the Germans had upset, set up their soup kettles to feed the troops. And they acted like they were on a picnic of sorts, and we ate with them, we moved around with them. And uh, meanwhile, in our cafe, German officers had come in. They came into the backyard in their open car, and they ordered steak and eggs and coffee and beer and cognac, and they paid for it. And we took in more money that day than we had taken in in a whole month before that. So all of a sudden, it seemed like we were coming out of the Depression, which is indeed was the case. Uh, there was no more unemployment, obviously, in Holland all of a sudden. The, the factories opened up. Everybody had to go to work for the German war effort, and the economy spruced up. And for a while, the relationship between the Germans, the occupiers, and the Dutch was pretty congenial. And a lot of Dutchmen became Nazis. The, the, the Holland had a, their own uh, Nazi party, the NSB, uh, and about 15% of the Dutch people became Nazis, although that wore off after a while when they started rounding up young men to work in the factories. And a lot of young folks, young men especially, didn't want to work for the Germans. 
and uh, disappeared into the underground and started sabotaging the Germans, which of course resulted in reprisals and people being executed. So that love affair at the beginning of the war wore off kind of rapidly, and especially when the Jews, about a year, two years into the war, the Jews had to wear a Star of David, and they couldn't go to school anymore, and we had a sign on our restaurant for Yoda Verboten, Jews not allowed. Uh, they couldn't ride a bus, couldn't sit on a park bench, and then they rounded them up little by little, always in the middle of the night, until there were no more Jews in town. So you can imagine uh, the relationship between the Dutch populations and the Germans deteriorated rapidly. You went from almost an awe at a 10-year-old to the, the shock and fear just a few years later of the transformation? Um, as a kid, it didn't sink in as such. To me, anything that happened was exciting. Anything was exciting. Being bombed was exciting. The Jews being rounded up was tragic, but it was ex exciting. I didn't see the war and the bombing and the occupation the way the grown-ups did. I thought it was more exciting having German soldiers in the house than uh, living as a civilian. And we had German soldiers in the house from the very beginning. We had a, a bar and a restaurant. And uh, I grew up with all the German drinking songs and marching songs, and by the time I was 10, 11 years old, spoke German fluently. And in my mind, the whole war was exciting. When you wrote your book, Five Years Under the Swastika, did that perspective change and look back as an adult? No, because when I wrote it, well, brought that about, I was a guest speaker at AFA, the Air Force Association in, uh, in Tampa, and I gave my talk about what it was like. And when the talk was over, my audience were bombardiers and gunners and pilots from the 8th Air Force who had bombed Holland and Germany. And they said, man, that is funny. You ought to write a book about it. So I wrote the book and I gathered up all the pictures and talked to my brothers and sisters. And I called the book, War is Fun. Because that's the way I had seen the war and everything with it, especially when two things happened. One was, we grew up with the idea of stealing from the Germans is not really stealing. That's only taking back what they took from us in the first place. So that gave us a lot of leeway. And you won't believe all the things, unless you read the book, you won't believe all the things that we stole. But it gave us license to steal anything that wasn't attached, as long as we could get away with it. And then the second thing happened, after the Garden Market exercise in 44, September 44, the bridge too far, if you remember that, mm -hmm. we didn't go to school anymore. So all we had to do was bum around. My father and mother were busy. They had five kids, and they had a cafe and a restaurant to run. They didn't have much time for us, so they gave us a lot of liberty. And we just bummed around, hung with the German soldiers. and generally enjoyed ourselves. So I saw the war from an entirely different viewpoint and I'm asked sometimes, were you ever afraid? A couple of times when the bombs came a little closer, uh, the American bombs are this, because the Americans uh, and, and the British, they bombed the living dickens out of us. The British at night at first, or the British, the first bombardment was by the British during the day in, in uh, in June of 41, before America was even involved in war, we were already being bombed on a daylight raid. And later on, when the Americans got involved, the British bombed at night and the Americans during the day. Now, the big bombers, the B-17s, B-26s and so on, they came over at a high altitude and they bombed Germany. They only bombed us locally if a plane was shot up and they dropped their load in order to limp back to England, and then the bombs uh, would hit our town. But generally, our town and our railroad tracks were not big enough a target for the, for the big bombers. But the fighter bombers, they were out all the time. When the sun was out, and thank God Holland has a lot of lousy weather. We don't have sunny days, but 100 a year. But when the sun was out, 
the fighter bombers would be there, especially the Americans, the P-51s, P-47s, and they bombed the living dickens out of everything. The Germans even had a slogan for them, because it would come out in two formations, echelon formations of four, and the Germans called it, which means there they are, the loyal eight, the standing guard over us. Because when the sun was out, the Germans couldn't move not the wagons, the trains, because the fighters would come and bomb and strafe the heck out of them. And I thought and that inspired me to say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a fighter pilot, because that's what I wanted to do, shoot the dickens out of things. And that's what you did. Let's move to 1951, when you were drafted by the Royal Netherlands Air Force. Right. You became a jet fighter pilot. Right. And you flew some of the first active jet fighters the U.S. produced. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, we were sent to the United States for training, and the first jet we flew was the T-33, which is the training version of the F-80. And the F-80 was actually the first combat jet that America had and flew in Korea. And then the F-84, which was a single-seat fighter, straight fighter, and those, uh, the F-84 was the main plane that I flew. Uh, once we graduated in Tucson after learning how to f shoot air-to-air, bomb, rocket, strafe, uh, we were sent back home to Holland, and for the rest of my career I flew the F-84 around, which by then was kind of an an antiquated, because America had F-86s, F-89s. We still had old F-84s. Did you, uh, were you in a plane that went down or lose comrades from that? Comrades, yes. I buried 11 of my buddies. And none of, because 